things I was going to get done and um, forgot some of them had to go back and get them done. <laughs> so it all worked out okay. Y'all were here and ready to go. Um, I was thinking on the way up here about a um, um, message I heard Jensen Franklin teach the other night about how God provides and some of this message will probably be a little bit along that line too but he said that God provides three ways. One uh, the pastor just quoted that scripture, as you give it will be given back to you. He said, shall men give into your bosom. God uses the hands of other people, the hands of men to do it. He also can sovereignly just sovereignly out of the, with no man involved like bringing manna from heaven. You can do it without having to uh, use anybody else. Uh, I heard this story one time about the man. Of course, you can come through the natural means, but um, I heard about this man um, needing a financial blessing. He was just really struggling. He kept praying and praying and praying, and um, his truck broke down. <laughs> doing things, don't he? Amazing. And then, of course, um, he does it through the hands of men. He does it solid. But, and then he gives you the ability, me and you the ability, to work with our own hands and supply our own needs. So you know, that was an awesome message. I appreciated it. But I want to look to the word of the Lord this morning. And uh, I'm hoping that I can convey this message to you as the Lord gave it to me, and I trust it will be a blessing. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and uh, verse 11, he just talked about how that um, we shouldn't act like the children of Israel when they had transgressed the Lord and gone back and, and tempted Christ in the wilderness and murmured and complained and all the things that they'd done. But verse 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them, for ensamples or examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So I'm going to go to the Old Testament today to teach a biblical lesson that applies to us today. Because it happened and God allowed it and used people to teach us a principle that God has for us. So if you will turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. David has been reigning king for almost at this point, I'm sure, close to 40 years. As he was king of Israel for 40 years. But he was chosen by God. Um, to be this king. And I'm going to read some of it in here because it's really interesting when you read it. It's 1 Chronicles chapter 28. Everybody got it? And I'm in the King James Version. If you're in another version, you're going to be able to know what I'm saying as we go along. And so David called the solemn assembly here. He assembled all the prince of Israel, the prince of the tribes, the captain of the companies and ministered to the king by course, that ministered to the king by course, and the captains over the thousands, captains over the hundreds, stewards all over the, the substance and possessions of the king, and of his sons, with the officers and with the mighty men, and with all the valiant men, even unto Jerusalem. All right, so what's he doing? He called everybody connected with his kingdom that had any kind of leadership ability or in any position of leadership. And David stood up on his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mind or in my heart to build a house of rest. Notice what he said. House of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. David said, I had a desire not only to be king uh, over a great nation, it was in my heart to be a great king over the nations, what I probably should have said, because God chose him to be that. But he said, I wanted to build God a house. I wanted to uh, do it for the Lord. I wanted it to be a house of rest. 
And he said, I wanted it to be a footstool for God. I wanted a place where God, we could say, God meets with his people. But what he said, but God said to me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. So a man of war who had to be a, a man of war had to fight the enemies of Israel, and he did, and he won many, many great victories. And this man of war wanted to build a house of rest, and God said, that's not the way I've got it planned. I'm, I'm not reading now, I'm telling you. <laughs> that's now how God had it planned. But he didn't have a plan for a house. Oh, let's go on. How be it the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler. And of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he liked me. I love to read that. Of all of the, his sons and all of his brothers, he said, God liked me. I preached a message on that one time. Does God like you? You know, when God likes you, you're in his favor. Yes. You know, there's one thing to love somebody, but then you've got to like them. you got to like them. Because you can love somebody without liking them. You know why? Because your love extends beyond their uh, personalities, beyond their characteristics, beyond what the person who they are. Your love goes beyond. But we don't always like what people do and say and think and act, right? So, but I'm glad when God likes us. Because <laughs> when God likes us, He loves us. That's, that goes without saying. But when He likes us, that means we pleased Him. Let me ask you this question. Can you really be pleased with somebody you don't like? You know why? Because they're, they're in conflict with your way of thinking they should act or do or whatever. And it's, it's hard to be pleased with their actions or their activities. So God's the same way with us. If, if we're not pleasing to God, then we better check up and make sure he likes us as well as loves us, right? All right, because when he likes you, we're under his favor. So he said, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons... For the Lord hath given me many sons. He hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be what? My son. See, he told David, David, Solomon, your son, I'm going to make him king, for I have chosen him to be my son. That's important that you understand that God chose Solomon not just because he was the son of David and the heir to the throne but God says I want Solomon to be my son. And Solomon not only was the wealthy now David was wealthy. You'll see here as you study this. David was very wealthy. David took his wealth and gave it to build the temple. But Solomon was arrayed in much glory and much honor. You know why? Because God liked him. He chose him out of all of David's sons to be king over Israel. He said, For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. David, he will no longer just be your son, but he will be my son, and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever. If he be constant to do my commandments and my judgment as of this day, he said, I will establish his kingdom forever based on the, uh, the, the, the ability, the commitment, uh, the structure of his life, his desire, his absolute commitment, I use that word again, to do my commandments and my judgment as at this day. In other words, he's going to have to make a commitment to me like I've made a commitment to him. I'm going to be a father. He's going to be my son. But he's got to do what I say. Now, that's not coming from a harsh God. Because with God's commandments comes blessings. 
And he's not standing there with a rod over your head commanding that you've got to do everything just like I say in a stern, strict voice like I am in charge and you're my subject. It's not that kind of a God. God says, I have a commandment that will bless you. If you'll do what I say, it's going to bring blessings in your life. Okay. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek. That was what he said. Keep and seek. And that's a word for us today. We keep the commandments of God, and we seek the face of God. We seek after his will in everything. For all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance for your children after you're gone. An inheritance is a future blessing coming your way, right? That's what I, okay, won't you keep that? And thou, Solomon, my son, this is God, know that the God of thy father, and know the God of thy father, he's got the word thou in there, but know the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, what will happen? He will cast you off forever. The seriousness of serving God is there. If you serve Him with all of your heart, great blessings are in store. But if you forsake Him, you'll be cast off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Now look at verse 11. Now David gave to Solomon, his son, the pattern of the porch Houses, treasuries, upper chambers, inner parlors. I'm just going. And he said, in the pattern of all he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of God and of all the chambers round about of the treasures of the house of God and of the treasures of the dedicated things. And then he goes on and give him a plan. He gave him not only a plan to build the sanctuary, but everything connected with it. And then he gave him an order of the priesthood uh, of the porters, the gatekeepers, everything in order. David lined it out for him. All right, now I want to skip over to verse 19. All this, said David, the Lord made me to understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. So David has a desire to build it, but God says, no, you're not going to do it. Your son's going to build it. But he gave David all of the plan. Every bit of it. Designed it. By, by what? By the handwriting. He said, I wrote on it. He made me understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. In other words, as David began to, God moved upon him, he began to draw it out. He began to plan it. He began to design it. He began to, in his mind, he could see it constructed to the very detail of all the porters and all, every, every room in the cold place was designed as God gave him the plan. Here's the message this morning. God has a plan. God will give you the plan. All right. There's three parts. God gave you the plan, but God, when God gives you the plan, he'll give you the provision. God has a plan, God always has a provision, and God always has a future in mind for you in that plan. Always has a future. Here's what he did to Solomon. Solomon, I want you for my son. I'm going to be your father. I'm going to establish your kingdom forever if you do my commandments. So he had a plan. Where did he get the provision? Here's what he did. This is, look at verse, chapter 29. Furthermore, David, the king, said to the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God the gold, for the things of gold, silver for the things of silver, brass for the things of brass, iron for the things of iron, wood for the things of onyx stones, 
stones to be set, uh, divers colors, precious stones, marble in abundance. Be Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of mine own proper good. It means I took my all the treasures I have, I poured it into this house. It's there, but I need somebody to build it. Solomon is not going to be the labor. He's going to be the king. So he went on to tell him, I want you to build a house. Here's the provision. Now build a house for Solomon. And I think it was probably many years in the making. But they built exactly the pattern. So God gave a plan. God gave the provision. And God had a future in it. He said, what's this lesson all about? One, it, it was, as I read to you, this was an example of what was to come. God sent forth his son, made of a woman. God had a plan for redemption for mankind, but he needed a son. He needed someone who would go to the cross for us. He needed someone who would fulfill this plan. And so he sent Jesus. And let me, let me just turn to Luke. And let's read it to you and then show you what he meant by this, what I'm saying here to you. There is a message in this, if I can get it out. In Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 26, the angel has appeared to Mary. And, of course, it startled her because he said, Angel said unto her, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. And she was wondering, of course, what he meant. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. See, God found somebody he liked. <laughs> of all the women, you know, he picked out Mary because she found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Amazing. That, that God would, would plan something through David, through a person that was chosen of his father's house because God liked him. But see, he just, just doesn't have a temporary idea in mind. Well, I'm just going to put David on the throne. He knew David was going to have a son named Solomon. It was going to be a portrayal of what God was going to do for us. He took Solomon as his son, God did, and said, I'm going to establish his throne forever. What's he going to do? He said, I'm going to give him the throne of his father, talking about Jesus, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So what, what God does on the earth to show us his plan in heaven, and this is what he did. You remember when Abraham was uh, was called to offer up his son Isaac on the altar? Well, Jesus was going to be offered up as well. And I truly believe if Abraham had not done what God had asked him to do, we, history may have been written a whole lot different. But in the process of him being willing to offer up his son, there was a provision to take his place. So you see, God has a plan. He, he just didn't have Abraham to do that just because I think it's a good thing. Abraham, I'm just going to see, you know, I'm just going to try you a little bit. No, there was a purpose in that. There was a plan, there was a provision, but there was a future involved here. A future plan of God. That he would send his son into the world to redeem us. You know why? Because we needed to be reconciled back to God. We needed to be translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. We needed to be redeemed. We needed to have God in our lives. We needed to be reconciled back to God. And so God chose a man by the name of David to have his son build a house. I'm, we'll go on. It'll, it'll come together in a few minutes for you. All right. And so he told her that this son she would have he would sit on the throne of his father David. There will come a time in the future, and God always has a future in mind when he plans something. There will come a time in the future when the trump of God shall sound and the church will be taken out of here. 
And then the tribulation, the, the three years, three and a half years, uh, and the latter part of the seven years will be the tribulation. And in how that he will come back and sit up on the throne of David over Israel. And all of the saints that have been redeemed will rule and reign with him in this kingdom as a part of this. This is a future plan of God. That there will be established a throne of righteousness in the city of Jerusalem, in the city of David, where there will be righteousness will reign for a thousand years in this earth. Then Satan will be loosed for a little while, and God's going to take care of him. And then behold, the great white throne judgment, and everything will be judged, and all things will be made new. There's a future that God had planned with everything way back from the beginning, because God knew the, the end from the beginning. But God uses men to set up his plan so we can get a little glimpse into what God is about to do. We see here in, in the life of, of David and Solomon uh, that he was setting up a future plan for us that God would send his son into the world that we might be redeemed. But there's a future beyond this, our redemption. There's a future for reigning with him. See what I'm trying to say? So God not only has a plan, he has a provision, but he has always has a future in mind. So what about us? Did you know every one of you were destined for a future? Jeremiah, we got it in the book of the paper all the time. He said, I know my thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord. Thoughts of good and not evil to give you a future. That's one of the translations. To give you a future. What is your future? Uh, a lot of people get depressed because they feel like they have no future. They have no hope. The Bible says that in Hebrews, we quote it all the time, faith is the substance of the things that we expect or hope for. It is the evidence of things that we have not seen. Well, we live in hope or of an expectation of a future. We're always looking toward the future. Our life is based on the fact that we're going to live somewhere at some point in time and we're not going to just die as babies. We're going to live. We're going to have a future. From the time we come here, there's a future plan for us. We, we live, you know, we go through school, we, we expect to get a job or go to college or become this or become that, uh, you know, may possibly get married, have a family, whatever. We have plans for the future. And I want to remind you, there is a future. There is a future. You're going to live forever somewhere. There is a future for you. Life, as we know it here, is not the end. God didn't make us for death. He made us for life, for a future. So we can break this down. See, within every word of God, every prophetic word, every prophetic plan, there's a plan within a plan within a plan. See, because God plans for us individually. God has a plan for us with individuals. We have an individual relationship with God. He's got purposes and callings and anointings and plans for each one of us. We just need to search and seek. Or, you know, keep and seek. That's the word. Keep and seek. Everybody say, keep and seek. We need to keep and seek. And God is never through with us until he calls us home. And then there's a great future. You know what? We don't have to worry about the future or even consider the future. The future at that point is already planned on our behalf. Yes. And what we've done down here is going to determine what that future will be after we leave here. So for each individual, for us, if we keep and seek, then God has purpose right now. Right now. And the Bible says, be faithful over a few things and I'll make you ruler over many. So what is our plan as God's plan, we are faithful to whatever God's called us to do, whatever he has planned for us. If we get our plans and our concepts of what God wants us to do ahead of God's, then oftentimes we even push back God's plans for us 
And that may possibly delay the great plan that God has for us or the blessings God for, has got for us. And we may never really understand the full purpose that we were down here for. But if we allow God to show us his plan and his purpose, like David. David said, as God gave it to me, I began to draw it out and plan it. See, the Bible gives us thoughts and ideas, and we've got to weigh them out through God and through the scriptures so that we will know what his purpose and plans are. I've had a lot of ideas in my lifetime, and you have too. Some was from God, and some was from Dorothy. I had to figure out which was God and which was Dorothy because all of us have a mind to, um, to think and to do. And I'm sure, in, in some cases, I missed God's plan, and I messed up mine. <laughs> you know, we've probably have all done that, right? But aren't you glad we can still keep and seek? Amen. Still keep and seek. Amen. Uh, in Hebrews um, chapter 3, it's talking about this. Um, and, and I'll just start with verse 1. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. This writer in Hebrews is, is telling us to, to think about who Jesus really was. First of all, he was the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. He was faithful. And he compared him to Moses as being faithful. But for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who had built the house has more honor than the house. <coughs> when a house or a structure goes up, a house may look magnificent. I mean, that be a structure that you just say, well, man, that's out of this world. But the designer, the architect, the engineer, the one who actually designed the house, gets the credit for the house. The house itself stands there as a plan of someone, whether it be a man or a woman who designed it. All right. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. He's the builder. The Bible says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. He dealt to us a measure of faith, but then it's up to us to allow him to uh, put into us the word of God, which causes that faith to be built into a great faith. All right. And he said, as Moses was very, very was faithful in all his house as a servant for the testimony of those things. Which, but notice what it said, but Christ as a son over his own house. This is when this is how we compare Solomon as a son over his house. The house that God planned. The house that God provided for. A house that God had a future in mind, not just for Solomon, but for you and me today. And so now Christ is the son over his own house, whose house we so you see, we are his house. We're his dwelling place. We are now sons of God. We are now children of the Most High. We are now in the kingdom of his dear son. That's what the Bible says. We've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. So now we are in this house. We're in this kingdom. There's a God had a future kingdom in mind. And it wasn't just Israel. The nation of Israel is still God's chosen, still God's blessed, but there's a kingdom greater, and that's the kingdom called the church that he's head over. He's head over this house. The Bible says he's been given a name that's been exalted above every name, and that he's the head of the church. He's the firstborn of every creation. He's, he's, he's everything to us. He's the Son of God that's come to us 
to establish the kingdom and make us a part of it. So individually, he's got a plan. He's got a provision for you. And he's got a future for you. Just like he told Solomon. So whose house we are, just like he told Solomon, Solomon, you've got to seek it and keep it. Say it again. Seek it and keep it. And he said, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope. How long? How long? Anybody got a Bible? Nobody's got it open. <laughs> Firm till how long? Until the end. Until the end of what? Until you no longer have a choice and you've already is drawn into your future. As long as you're in this flesh, you have choices. As long as you have the mind and you're on this side of eternity, you have a choice. I have a choice. I can either keep and seek or I can lose and lose. <laughs> uh -huh. Lose and sleep. Lose and sleep, right. Seek and keep or lose and sleep. That's good, Jay. But if we keep the hope, but he says, keep the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, the expectation of your future. Do you know you have a right to expect God to keep his word? You have a right, a right to expect God to bless you for your faithfulness. You have a right to expect him to love you. You have a right to expect him to like you. But you have to please him. So you need to just, you know, sometimes talk to the Lord and say, you know, Sister Lucy used to sing, I want my Lord to be satisfied with me. Remember that? I want my life to be what he'd have it be or something like that. You remember the words? Well, you know, that's good songs. We need to just, you know, talk to God sometimes and say, God, do you really like me? Am I pleasing you? And if you want him to talk back to you, he will. You may not like what you hear because he might say, you know what? You need to do this and this. <laughs> I've had him do it to me. And he will. But the thing I want to leave you today is to work, keep and seek. Because you've got a future. But you've got to keep it, the confidence and the rejoicing. You've got to both keep your faith and your joy of living. You know, when you get to the point that what you're doing for God becomes a drudgery, something's not right. When you get to the point that coming to church is, is more of an effort than it is a joy, something's wrong. When you get to the point that you, it's, it's harder and harder to read the Word of God and it's harder and harder to pray, something's not right with our relationship. If you don't enjoy the journey, don't enjoy what you're doing, something's wrong. You've lost your vision somewhere. You've lost your zeal. We've lost our um, excitement about God. And that's what happens sometimes in relationships. When you lose loving to be with someone or with that person or your know, husbands and wives, when you when you lose the, the joy of the relationship, that relationship's in trouble. And when we lose lose that excitement and that love for Jesus and that love just to just to be in his presence, something's wrong and it ain't on his part got to be with us, right? Because we have something come between us in our relationship with the Lord. So I want to leave you with that this morning. That he
Alex.